In this video, we'll go through all the different image effects in the new post-processing stack. We'll talk about what they do and how we can use them. This video is also the first sponsored video on this channel. However, today's sponsor is actually something that I personally use and love. It's called Skillshare. It's an online learning community and it's a place where you can go to learn all sorts of creative skills. I've been using it to learn more about graphics programming. I actually found this really cool course on making generative art. It's really in depth and the author is a super funny guy. So a lot of you guys have been asking me to do procedurally generated stuff. Well, go check that out. Skillshare has over 15,000 classes for you to choose from. And there's especially a lot of cool design stuff like illustrated tips and app design using Sketch 3. Premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access, but I have a link for you in the description where you can get two months for free. I like free stuff too. All right, enough about Skillshare, let's get into it. So first off, we wanna import the post-processing stack. I imagine this will be integrated into the editor very soon, but for now we'll just go window, asset store, let's search for post processing, and let's select the post processing stack. I'll also have a link to this in the description. Let's now hit import. When this window pops up, we'll hit import again. And you should now see that a folder called post processing has appeared in your project panel. Now, in order to get this working inside of our game, we have to select our main camera. We're gonna add a new component and the component we want to add is the post processing behavior. We need this on every camera that we want to apply post processing effects to. And this takes in a post processing profile. A profile is basically just a data object where we can adjust our effects. So we'll go into to the project panel, right click, create, and we'll select post processing profile. I'm just gonna call this one CC for color correction. And you can see that when we select this object, we have all of these different effects available to us. Remember to also select the camera and drag in the profile you just created. So now we are actually ready to apply effects. However, there are a few settings on our camera that I recommend you set if you wanna get the most quality out of your game. The first one is the rendering path. We can change this from forward to deferred. This will give us a lot more lighting fidelity, but it is also harder on the hardware and not supported on some platforms. Whenever we select deferred here, we also have to disable multi-sample anti-aliasing. We'll have a look at anti-aliasing in just a second. On top of this, we'll also go under edit, project settings, quality, and in here, make sure to disable anti-aliasing. We'll add this through an image effect in just a second. And finally, we can go to our camera and select allow HDR. HDR stands for high dynamic range, and it's a way of packing more color data into your image. Image. This gives us greater control over the look of the scene when we start applying image effects and helps us avoid clipping where you lose color information in very bright or dark spots. Now that all of our camera settings are correct, we can go to a CC object and start messing around with the image effects. Let's begin at the very top here with anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing is the process of reducing jagged edges. It adds interpolation to try and smooth out stair-step-like lines. Let's enable it, and you can see immediately what this does to our edges. It really helps smooth them out. Now in here we actually have the ability to choose between two methods. The fast approximate or the temporal. Fast approximate is faster, but a bit lower quality. And temporal is of course the opposite, higher quality, but also more expensive. I find that I very rarely use the temporal anti-aliasing, but it is here and offers a lot more settings. However, in Unity 5.6, I have found that it sometimes causes some weird behavior. Normally you just have to kind of enable it, re-enable it, maybe change some settings until it draws right. For now, I'll be sticking to the fast approximate. And in here, you also have the ability to choose between quality and performance. So next is ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion darkens areas where two surfaces surfaces intersect to create shadows and places where light would have a hard time escaping from. This can be done very precisely by baking the lighting into a light map or in the fly with post-processing using a technique called SSAO, Screen Space Ambient Occlusion. Let's enable it and you can see the shadows being applied here to the places where two surfaces meet. Now this is a good one to adjust a bit. The intensity is pretty self-explanatory. I like to keep this pretty high when I'm setting all the other settings, just to make everything visible. Then we have the radius. This is how close we want the shadows to be. So if we decrease this, we can see that that we are kind of shrinking in the shadows. And we can of course also increase them. For this game here, I'm gonna set them to something like 0.12 maybe. I think that looks all right. Actually, might bump it up to 0.2. Then we have the sample count. This is the number of ambient occlusion samples for each pixel on the screen and determines the smoothness of the rendering. I find that medium often works pretty well. You can see the difference to high here. But since we assumed in so far, I actually think I'm gonna increase high in this case. Gets rid of some of that weird banding. We can also disable downsampling. Downsampling will have 
half the resolution of the effect in order to save on performance, but I find you can just gain so much visual fidelity by disabling it. You will, however, have a big cost on performance here. So it's always a matter of what you can do for your game and the platform you're targeting. Now, I almost never use the next settings here, so I'm just gonna bump down the intensity here and we can move on. Next up is screen space reflection. This effect computes reflections based on the surface roughness. It can help make materials feel more lifelike because they actually reflect the surrounding environment. So in a current scene here, we don't really have any objects that would be influenced by screen space reflection. If we enable it, you can see it doesn't make too much of a difference. But let's just for fun take our ground here and add some kind of reflective material to it. I've just gone ahead and created a material here with a fairly high metallic value and a fairly high smoothness. And you can see now that our ground is indeed creating reflections from the objects in our scene. If we go and select our color correction object and go into the screen space reflection tab, you can see there's a lot of settings here. Here's how it looks without. You can definitely play around with a lot of these. Most of the time you'll probably want physically based reflection. You can set the quality between high and low. I find that low is often good enough. You also have the max distance until you cannot see reflections anymore. Most of the time the iteration count is fine as is. Same thing with the step size and width modifier. Here you can decide how much you want to blur out the reflections. You can choose whether or not you want to reflect back faces. I would leave this off in cases where you use mostly horizontal surfaces, but enable it if you have a lot of vertical reflections. The reflection multiplier allows us to boost the reflections, the distance at which the reflection should start fading, and then we have the Fresnel fade. You can see these two sliders adjust how the reflections look the further we get away from the surface. Then we have depth of field. This effect simulates the properties of a real camera lens, meaning that it applies focus only to objects with a certain distance from the camera. The rest of the image is blurred, and bright spots get highlighted with circular artifacts, which we refer to as bokeh. Let's enable that. And in our case, we can't actually see this effect yet. That's because we have to adjust some settings here. Now, a lot of people really get confused about what these terms mean, at least if you're not really into photography. The focus distance is fairly self-explanatory. This is the distance from the camera where we put our focus point. However, the aperture and focal length are a bit more technical. Our focal length in camera terms represents the distance between our lens and the film. A greater focal length means more blurring. This is also why you get more blur when you zoom in with the camera than when zoomed out. So if we go ahead and bump this up to something like 70, we can't actually see too much blurring yet. That's because there's another value that has effect on how much we blur. That's the aperture, or often referred to as f-stop. This is effectively how much we open our lens in order to let light in. The lower the value, the wider we open the lens. And the wider we open the lens, the more blur we get. So if we just decrease this, we can see that we should stop blurring things in our scene. Of course, we don't want to go overboard with this, but we can easily put it at around, say, 1. We can then take our focus distance and decrease it to place it around our barrel and wheels. So I think that looks pretty decent if we want this kind of macro shot. We could also go ahead and increase the f-stop if we want to see more of the background, or decrease the focal length. I think these settings look pretty fine for now. Then we have motion blur. Motion blur, well, Blurs motion. In real life, a camera takes in light over small periods of time. If the camera moves during these periods, the image gets stretched out, creating motion blur. I think it's pretty much a must-have effect for fast-moving games. So to test out our motion blur, I've gone ahead and added an FPS controller to our scene. This way we can move around and see the motion blur in action. If we then enable motion blur under our color correction, it should actually already be working just fine. If I go ahead and hit play, we can see that when I move around, the image indeed gets blurred. And it makes everything look much smoother, especially if you turn it off in comparison. The two main sliders to worry about here is the shutter angle and the sample count. The higher the shutter angle, the more the motion blur. I'm just gonna put this to something like 300. The higher the sample count, the more smooth the motion blur gets. This will also have an impact on performance, so I think leaving it at 10 is fine for most cases. You can also use the multiple frame blending. This is mostly used for artistic purposes if you want to get the drunk effect. Let me go and turn it up to 1 here so you can see what that looks like. We also have eye adaption. This effect adjusts the exposure of the image as the game is running, creating the illusion of an eye adjusting itself to a lighting environment. At the time of making this video, the eye adaptation documentation is pretty sparse, and I don't want to just assume what the different parameters mean. For me to work fine so far without having to tweak anything, I'll have a link to the documentation in the description as well. Now we have an effect that can really help make your game pop, which is also why it's so overused. It's called Bloom. Bloom makes light from a bright source bleed into surrounding objects. In other words, it allows us to add glow to bright spots. Let's enable it, and you can see immediately that it really helps bring our fire to life. The effect gives us a few settings. The first one is the intensity, and this is just the brightness on the stuff that we want to bloom. I think a value of 0.5 is pretty okay here. Then we have the threshold. This defines how bright a pixel should be in order to be registered by the effect. So if we set this to a very low number, you can see that we bloom pretty much the entire scene. And if we increase it, only the bright 
brightest of bright spots will get bloomed. I think in our case, a value of around 1.4 is going to be quite all right. The soft needs how it blends from things under the threshold to things over the threshold. You can see what that does here. I normally just leave that at 0.5. We then have the radius. This is how much we want to go ahead and blur the lighting from the original pixels. Kind of the size of the effect. Be careful not to overdo this one. Sometimes when you have a moving camera, you can get some really weird flickering. If you check the anti-flicker, it will help prevent that. Finally, you can also apply a dirt texture on top of the camera. The post-processing stack comes with a few ones that you can try out. I normally don't use these too much. The next one is really important. It's color grading. Color grading is without a doubt the largest of the effects because it allows us to control the overall look of our image in terms of exposure, color and contrast. Let's check it and you can see immediately that it really flattens out our image. That's because it's currently using the tone mapper. Now I want to be explicit about this. You only want to use the tone mapper, meaning having this set to neutral or filmic if you're using HDR. If you have HDR unchecked, you should go ahead and select none. The neutral tone mapper is going to lay out your colors and brightness values so that they look really flat. This allows you to apply very hard color correction on top of that. It just makes sure that we don't lose a lot of color data so that we can pretty much go in any direction with the image that we want. We can go ahead and adjust some of the settings for the tone mapper here, but I'm actually pretty satisfied with this. So I'm instead going to go down and apply some color correction. First off, we have the exposure. This is the overall brightness of the scene. Then we have stuff like temperature, tint, hue shift, saturation, and contrast. I want to apply a bit of contrast here, probably also bump up the exposure a bit. I think I'm going to leave the temperature and maybe tint it slightly magenta. We can also shift the hue here, which gives a pretty dramatic change. And the saturation, I think I'm pretty much just going to leave as is. We then have the channel mixer here which allows you to change properties for the different colors and you can also use the trackballs which I like to do. I'm gonna give it a bit of red in the high end here, some more green in the mid and some blue in the darks. If you right click one of these it's going to reset it. We also have a curves adjustment here if you want to go in here you can add keys in order to bump up say the brightness here and maybe decrease it a bit on the low ends. We can go in and select another channel say the red channel here add a key here and you can change that around as well. So it's really easy to do color adjustments in here. I'm satisfied with the look of this. You can see what it looks like before and after. Instead of doing the color grading in the engine itself, you can also use the Yuzu LUT. LUT stands for lookup texture. It's an optimized way of performing color grading because you grade your image beforehand in another program, such as Photoshop, and then export the color data into a LUT that is then read by Unity. If that's something you want to use, you put in the texture here, and you can also adjust the blending factor here. But we'll just be using the built-in color grading. Then we have some of the more niche artistic effects. The first one is chromatic aberration. This filter simulates chromatic chromatic distortions at the edges of the screen. Chromatic aberration is often seen in lower quality camera lenses. If we enable this and bump up the intensity, we can immediately see the effects. I actually think it's pretty cool to have in here, but this is way too much. Let's leave it at around 0.15. You can also set a spectral texture, which is going to shift the hue of the chromatic aberration. By default, it generates one for you, but there are also some available under textures, spectral LUTs, and we can just try out one of the other ones here, say the blue red. We bump up the intensity now, you can see that looks a bit different. I actually like this one even better. We then have grain. This effect simply adds a layer of grain to simulate filmic noise. Let's enable that. I don't think this particularly suits our scene here, but we have an intensity slider, we have the size of the grains, and how much they should be affected by the luminance of our scene. You can also choose whether or not you want them to have color. I'm just gonna disable this for our scene. Then we have a vignette. A vignette can be used to darken the edges and corners of an image. This is often visible when lenses are zoomed in and can be used to great dramatic effect. If we enable this, we can see that by the default the effect is pretty strong. I definitely like this for a scene because it helps draw attention to whatever is in the center, but I think we should decrease it a little bit. We're gonna adjust stuff like the center point, the color of the vignette, the smoothness, the roundness, which is easier to see if we go ahead and bump up the intensity. And you can choose whether or not you want this to be rounded. That means should it be completely circular or should it be kind of adjusted to fit the aspect ratio of our screen. You can see that on and off here. You can also change the mode from classic to masked and this allows you to improve put your own black and white texture to use as the vignette. This can be cool if you want to do stuff like dirt or blood on your screen. But I'm just going to go with classic and I want to bump down the smoothness a tiny bit but also increase the intensity. So I like that a lot. Finally we have dithering. Dithering is the process of reducing banding in gradient areas by introducing some controlled noise to the image. We won't be using this effect here but here's an example of an image with and without dithering. So that concludes all of the different image effects that you can apply to your game. If we go ahead and hit play now we can see the effects of these as the 
game is running. And if we select our main camera, we can see what it looks like with and without. So really a huge bump up in quality just by adjusting a few knots. That's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a future video. Also, to those of you interested in Skillshare, click the link in the description. I found it to be a good resource for game developers as well. In fact, I recently saw a course on logo design for video games, so that's pretty cool. And if you want to become a teacher on Skillshare, you can do so as well. Simply make an account and sign up to become a teacher. So you guys will check out Skillshare. Also, I really want to hear what you guys think about the format of this video. After all, it is the first sponsored one on the channel. So let me know if there's anything I can do to improve. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in April and a special thanks to Derek Heemskirk, Faisal Marify, James Callahan, Cyborg Mummy, Cole Cabral and Jason Latito. If you want to become a patron yourself, you can do so at patreon.com slash brackies.